My name is Joseph Wunderlich. I'm a professor of engineering, architecture, and computer science. I was born in 1961. I uh, graduated from the University of Texas in Austin, of architectural engineering in 1984. Uh, also very close to a second degree in urban design at the University of California at San Diego. I worked as an urban planner as well as coordinating the architecture, engineering, and development uh, and construction and of hundred million dollars of development in Texas and California. Uh, then around the age 30, uh, I switched into computer engineering, although I still did architecture and have done architectural works uh, for my entire life. Uh, my graduate work is in electrical and computer engineering, my master's and uh, PhD, as well as IBM research. And I was a professor at Purdue and uh, I've been in academia now full time for 22 years. Uh, you can find details about me on my website and also lecture th series on uh, architecture theory, uh, as well as uh, on Frank Lloyd Wright, um, courses in green architectural engineering, uh, materials and methods, uh, architectural studio courses uh, with uh, lectures on uh, lighting and acoustic design as well as a freshman seminar on conceptual architecture. Uh, so we'll go rapidly through this uh, lecture series or through these uh, lectures. The idea is to uh, go quickly through them with the audio and then come back and I'd like students to take a look more closely, clicking on the links and reading a little slower than at the speed I will be teaching at. In this first part of our lecture series on Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, from ages 0 to 19, 1867 to 1886, uh, part of the formative years, uh, those two first lectures, two parts will be on his formative years uh, up until age 33. Um, <clears throat> the context of the times in this first part, uh, it's post-Civil War recession uh, that just ended, uh, there's an industrial revolution going on, uh, actually the second industrial revolution, but the, the main industrial revolution of uh, manufacturing, uh, also farm li life as he grows up on the farm in uh, Wisconsin, and then the influence of his father, who's a preacher uh, to make a living, but really uh, an established musician and goes on to be more well known for that. And that influences Frank Lloyd Wright throughout his life. And then his mother who homeschools him using uh, foible methods and the foible blocks, and um, that influences him a great deal. Also, also his mother's large influential Unitarian family of Welsh farmers in uh, Wisconsin, uh, nature and love of nature, and that's also part of the Unitarian belief system, uh, but he, and he's growing up in nature, and then unfortunately his parents divorce. Uh, architecturally, uh, the foible schooling we're going to look at and the and influence on him uh, directly in his designs. And then uh, the barns and farmhouses, a separate lecture here you can click on and uh, look at. Uh, and <clears throat> then the roots of his organic design, organic architecture, which he establishes and is well known for. Uh, these are the majority of the references that I've used for these uh, uh, this lecture series, and uh, they're worth taking a look at each of them individually if, when you have time. Frankly, Wright was born right after the Civil War, something that ripped this country apart. Uh, he was born in a, a northern state, not part of the Confederacy, in the Midwest. Uh, he was born in Wisconsin and uh, the Bear Valley. And um, this was the second industrial revolution, uh, the main technology industrial revolution of the, uh, that people think of. Uh, expansion of the rail allowed movement of people and ideas, electrical power and telephone lines. Um, he changed his name to Lloyd Donner, his mother. That's his mother's maiden name. Uh, and there's a little bit of history here. We'll learn about that. Uh, lived through uh, some of the most productive but also most destructive times of uh, human civilization with two world wars. 70-year career, 
He died at 91 years old, 1959. His father, uh, his father is often credited with a lot of uh, uh, innate uh, creativity that he has, although his mother really schooled him and took care of him and, and uh, persuaded him or uh, uh, facilitated his becoming an architect more than anything. His father wasn't around a lot. He was trying to make money. Uh, uh, it wasn't easy after the Civil War. There was a big recession. He was mainly making money as a preacher, uh, although he was also a lawyer, superintendent of schools, and uh, perhaps most notably a musician uh, and a composer. And so Frank Lloyd Wright was very much influenced by that and put uh, pianos in many of his designs, have uh, uh, music education as part of the fellowship. We'll talk about later lectures of the Masters of Architecture uh, at the Frank Lloyd Wright uh, Taliesin West and East uh, schools. And so his father, uh, highly educated at the time, very few people had any kind of education at all then. Uh, and so we were talking about a long time ago here, uh, his father had a, a, a bachelor's and master's from Colgate, a very good school. Uh, he had, his first wife died and uh, uh, and uh, was a music student. And then um, uh, they had five children with his first wife and only three lived. That was not uncommon at the time. Um, then he was a preacher. And then he met his second wife, Frank Lloyd Wright's mother, uh, before Frank was, was born, Anna Lloyd in Wisconsin. Uh, his love of music, uh, this is a quote here, uh, I believe, uh, from the Ken Burns documentary on, uh, on Frank Lloyd Wright, which uh, won an Academy Award, I believe, or an Oscar uh, for documentaries. Um, uh, I met Ken Burns at, uh, at Gettysburg. He signed my book on the Gettysburg uh, on the Civil War series. Uh, but uh, it's an excellent quote that uh, architecture is like composing a symphony. You arrange and build plot and plan in very much the same way. This is not a quote by Ken Burns, but by someone in, the, in this uh, documentary. Uh, Frank often specified piano in his large spaces, as well as uh, in his school. So his father was moving around um, uh, quite a bit, trying to find uh, places to preach and get donations um, for that, which was hard at the time, right after the Civil War. Um, love music. Uh, William Carey Wright writes, uh, of a musical form as a geometric puzzle fitting art into space William taught uh, his son the structural composition between music and buildings. This is uh, from the Penn Rare Book Archives. Uh, his mother. Now, his mother was very ambitious and, uh, and, and very closely taught him and, and mentored him. Uh, she was a teacher and she convinced uh, uh, she was convinced from an early age that her son would be a great architect. She hung pictures of architecture in his bedroom, and then she homeschooled him. Here's just some other uh, people in time that have been homeschooled. Uh, it can be a great thing if it's done done right and with dedication. And then these are some of the earliest uh, influences on Frank Lloyd Wright. You'll see pictures of these in his home and studio in a video blog that... Uh, uh, that I'd like you to take a look at later on, um, <clears throat> that I did at 31 sites in and around Ch Chicago and Oak Park. But this is uh, Froebel Gifts. So we're going to learn about what who Froebel is, what these Froebel Gifts are. But these toys, um, at an early age, are influencing Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright. You see different uh, colors, textures, forms blocks, various kinds of blocks. And he would reference these in, in his books, Frank Lloyd Wright would later on, as being a major influence. Blocks. So in my architecture studio classes, the intro ones, you'll see assignments often, students uh, working with blocks, 
colored two-dimensional shapes as well as the three-dimensional shapes. Sticks, various shapes. It's all the Froebel gift set. Uh, her linear gift. She saw these when she was uh, visiting a symposium in Philadelphia. Um, and when they were living in uh, Massachusetts. Uh, so <clears throat> she had an inten intense, uh, his mother had intense interest in the Froebel system uh, as basis for elementary geometry behind all natural uh, birth of form. Uh, this is a quote by, these are quotes from Frank Lloyd Wright in his book. Uh, all these, a mother learned geometric elements were what should first be made visible to the child mind. The smooth cardboard triangles and maple wood blocks were most important. All are in my fingers today. In outline, the square was significant of integrity, the circle infinity, the triangle aspiration, all with which to design significant new forms. So uh, this man, Froebel, Froebel was uh, the inventor of the Froebel system. We'll see a little bit about him here. So he, um, <coughs> We want to dig down into the roots of not only who influenced Frank Lloyd Wright, but who influenced the influencers. It's all part of the, the mesh that uh, uh, of uh, exposure to the design and creativity of Frank Lloyd Wright's youth. So Frederick Froebel, uh, 1782 to 1852. So this is all before Frank Lloyd Wright was born. Uh, he was a Swiss, the Swiss government invited him to train elementary school teachers, uh, Froebel. Uh, he opened a, a, a child nurture activity institute, um, and he believed in the underlying unity of all things and to learn from nature. And we're going to see some uh, relation of this to other th influences on Frank Lloyd Wright that are similar and how uh, those influences may have converged. Uh, to have even greater influence. Uh, so the underlying unity of all things and to learn from nature, that is key. We'll talk about his organic design, his Unitarian belief system of his mother's family, uh, how that was the beginnings and then always part of his, uh, his uh, character. Teacher's, uh, the teacher's role is not to drill or indoctrinate, but to encourage self-expression through play uh, and to learn from doing, self-activity, uh, and also, they played uh, music and songs along with what uh, they were learning. This is Froebel now. This is not his father. This is completely separate. This is uh, somebody who influenced his mother's teaching, Frank Lloyd Wright's mother's homeschool teaching. Um, and so you see music here also coming through his mother's influences. So a little more depth here. Uh, if you are aware of Montessori schools, uh, his work inspired Maria Montessori um, later on. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, uh, Maria Montessori was in parallel to when Frank Lloyd Wright uh, was coming of age and with her, um, her great contributions to education. So beginning in Italy and, uh, and you know, Froebel was, had died before both of them long ago, but had influenced uh, them uh, directly Maria Montessori and indirectly through Frank Lloyd Wright's mother and her formal use of formal methods. So it began in Italy and then just some details here. I won't go through all the details, but Montessori schools, there's many of them, hands-on activity uh, and, and the way the students work in groups. Um, uh, you mix the students together and have giant time blocks. A lot, of, a lot of free form kind of thing. No formal grading or punishment and reward. Just portfolios and um, you know a mind body spirit thing. You'll hear about that. Uh, I talk about that in a number of courses that I've taught. Other kinds of courses. Um, <clears throat> a freedom with limits, independence, and a respect for individual psychology, physical and social development. Um, this is from the Montessori website here, so you can look a little more. And I have a couple of slides here just to show you some examples. Uh, California school, one in Arizona, in Illinois, Wisconsin, New York, Connecticut, 
Pittsburgh, Puerto Rico, so it's international also. These are all just pictures I found on the internet. Uh, typically, I'll it'd be clear where I got pictures from, but uh, sometimes it's just random selections off the internet where it's appropriate and doesn't require citation. Uh, you can see all the references in the beginning of this lecture. Uh, Canada, India, England, more England, uh, just homeschool, Montessori methods. I like to think I did some of this. I know I did some of this with my children. And Italy, the birthplace of it all. Uh, one of my favorite places to go. I've taught in Italy. I uh, speak um, a little bit of Italian. Uh, I've been there six times. And I love to return. So this verbal system of blocks, uh, arguably, um, very similar to our Lego systems now. Also Minecraft. I've had a number of students. I ran some world servers for several years, about eight, nine years ago, with many children from around the world. Had freshmen, uh, college students uh, build towns, uh, Japanese towns, green towns <clears throat> in different years. We had competitions involving high school students coming in. Um, and very successful. Uh, you can drill down here later on and take a look at all of this. Uh, this. There's a million things in here, many pages of uh, uh, Minecraft. Things also used for computer engineering too, because you can make actually circuits and things in there. So we had uh, a world just for that. I had, uh, six worlds in the main, we had several different main worlds over the years. And then this one main world had six different sub-worlds in it, multi-world server. And we had uh, the main students, uh, children from America, Canada, England, Australia, and uh, Ireland. Uh, then you can certainly come back, take a look at this later. So I, I gave a couple of talks. I was invited uh, a keynote speaker in Osaka, Japan about this. And then also uh, an additional uh, later lecture in, in London. So you can drill down. There's lots of things to look at here uh, later on. Uh, this is the London talk. And so I now compare it to all these case studies, including uh, the United Nations using uh, Minecraft. So back to Froebel now. So Froebel. Um, <coughs> You ask yourself, you know, what, how people are influenced. So Froebel had, a, uh, everybody could see the influence on, uh, and his mother would state this too. Frank Lloyd Wright's mother would uh, uh, quote uh, Froebel and uh, or uh, reference Froebel uh, in her teachings and the Froebel methods. Everybody knew this. Um, and, uh, uh, who is Froebel? So Froebel, again, died before Frank Lloyd Wright was born. Uh, from born in the 1700s, influenced by German Romantic philosophers, Greek thinkers, and Taoist and Buddhist teachings. Now that's unusual at the time, right? This isn't, you know, a couple hundred years after the Protestant Reformation, and uh, uh, you know, it, it's it's not a popular thing to to think outside the box. He's doing this in, in Germany. Um, Although devout Christian, he frequently had resistance from the church and other authorities for his radical thinking. Uh, he approached the universe scientifically and developed his materials to demonstrate the geometry and patterns of the physical world. Uh, and now he had his own origami system. So uh, you'll see I do a whole lecture on Japanese um, architecture and urban design uh, coming up. And now uh, he uh, had his own uh, folding system and, and certainly had influ was influenced by Asian uh, cultural things and thought. Um, but he had his own kind of system. And then um, uh, of origami. And paper folding is, uh, is a key thing in architecture to really think about the, the transition from two-dimensional to three-dimensional space, how a building is, is somewhat of a three-dimensional unfolded representation of a two-dimensional thing. And so this is, uh, you can go down and look in the tutorial this later on. This is Froebel's uh, 
version of origami. And then this is some exercises and certain courses I ask students to do, uh, depending on when you're uh, listening to this lecture, maybe um, you know, uh, look for direction whether or not you need to, to do this. Um, uh, but don't assume that you need to unless um, you're asked to in a particular course, which you may be. Uh, my freshman seminar students do need to do this uh, in the Frank Lloyd Wright specific course. Uh, it's not required the first time in here, but uh, uh, these are some very good videos that show you how to do it. Also, karagami. Uh, we've done this in a number of courses before, so this is actually unfolding uh, to not make animal shapes, but uh, buildings. And so this was something we did in Architecture Studio one uh, year. Um, and it's a, a fun thing to do, uh, educational thing to do. So more informable. So uh, yes, the, it sees gods in everything. So this is, you'll maybe uh, see the, how Frank Lloyd Wright's organic design and also the Unitarian Church uh, parallels this kind of thought. Uh, not influenced by Froebel in any way that I know, but in parallel, uh, you know, Froebel thoughts and Unitarian belief system both influence in Frank Lloyd Wright. So um, here's another video that you could watch um, on Shinto and Buddhist uh, influence on Japanese temples and shrines. Uh, not right now, but uh, again, go through these slides, you know, just listen here and then come back and take a look at these things in either the PDF or a PowerPoint a PPTX with embedded audio. Some of these lectures will be on my YouTube channel and then you can, uh, uh, you, you, you can, uh, I, I'll, I usually put a PDF below in the comments there so you can go and get to the links because I don't have the links embedded in the video when I, uh, I, I you know, play the video typically in maybe in a Zoom or vGrid and then upload or download the MP4 and then upload it to YouTube channel as well as my website. So anyway, uh, Froebel influence by Taoism, Buddhism, roots of, uh, and the roots of Shinto, which is, so, you know, in Japan, uh, there's two main religions, Shinto and Buddhism. I'm not a scholar of religion, but in general, what I know of it is uh, Shinto, or what I've heard is, you know, you're born uh, Shinto, and you die Shinto, and your the spirits are Shinto, but you live a Buddhist lifestyle, so... Uh, now we're talking about Taoism and Buddhism here. And Taoism is mainly from China, but it came and mixed with the indigenous religions of Japan early on and formed what is now one of the two main religions in Japan. But anyway, seeing gods in everything. So here's uh, some pictures from a trip to Japan in 2013, I believe, that I made. Uh, it's interesting to see the scale of the uh, Shinto shrine here, uh, <clears throat> or, or the, the gateway, the tori that uh, represents the, uh, the, the passageway from the, uh, the human world into the spiritual world. And this is huge. This is in Kyoto, where they don't let anything be tall, but this can be tall, uh, just for architectural purposes. Uh, and, and because it's a sacred city, I could talk all about Kyoto. But you can see a tractor trailer, a truck at the base of this, and that gives you an idea of the height of that thing. It's huge. It's very impressive. So now we want to switch gears a little bit. Now we're still talking about the earliest influences on Frank Lloyd Wright when he was a child, uh, but we just drilled down into looking at his mother's influence and how she was influenced by Froebel and how Froebel was influenced by Asian things. And that'll all come together later on when you see other Asian influences on Frank Lloyd Wright. But now we want to talk about um, how he was influenced by where they moved to. They moved to New England from Wisconsin. Uh, his father was a preacher and they're looking for work after the Civil War. And so ages four to 10. So now I'm going to talk about these different styles that you'll find in colonial uh, or in, uh, in New England and whether or not, uh, in my opinion, uh, or what I've seen referenced that uh, he has, uh, that could have possibly influenced some of Frank Lloyd Wright's designs. So first is the colonial style, which is common in England from the New England colonies, the original 13 colonies, especially up in the northeast of Massachusetts. Uh, this is the House of Seven Gables. Uh, gable is a big uh, shape you see there, the roof. 
And um, so, uh, you know, did that influence uh, uh, Frank Wright? Now, he's mo mostly known for horizontal styles and the prairie styles later on. Uh, but you know, he had many periods in his life of different designs, and his early works often uh, echoed some of these earliest influences. Then Victorian style, he did not care for Victorian style uh, in general, even though that was, uh, and you'll, although you see certain parts of it in some of his early designs, but he really didn't like the frilliness, the uh, gingerbread um, that you, you see uh, with uh, some of the types of Victorian, uh, the Queen Anne style, Victorian style. And so uh, we'll talk about more about this later on he has his own style in his organic architecture and organic ornamentation. It's not that he doesn't like details. It's just this particular uh, uh, gingerbread style he did not care for. And he's seeing Tudor in uh, uh, New England, Tudor style. Uh, he's seeing some federal style pointing out an eyebrow window here that I've seen in some of his early designs, his early designs. Um, Georgian style, I, I write no apparent influence. I didn't see anything. Uh, you know, I, I have a book of uh, approximately 500 of his designs. Um, perhaps you could find something in there you could arguably ar argue is uh, was an influence, but I have not seen something yet. Georgian style. Now, I do know that he did not like the neoclassical uh, style. So classic Roman and Greek columns, uh, like you see in this picture, and then uh, the neoclassical is just a recreation of that. And that was very popular at the time. But he did not care for that. Uh, so now we're still talking about other influences. So now uh, on Frank Lloyd Wright, and um, uh, due to his family moving around, so they moved back to Madison, Wisconsin when he's 10 years old. Uh, so they had some more children. Um, and he has step siblings also. So, and then father takes a job as a secretary of Wisconsin Unitarian Society, the Unitarian Church. Uh, a big influence, Unitarian. Um, well, they were landowners, first of all, in that area. Her family was very influential. Um, uh, and Unitarians believe in intellectual freedom, inspiration from, to gather inf inspiration from all religions. Um, their ethos is truth against the world. And they love nature, see God in everything. Now, where have we heard that before? So you see that uh, from the Froebel methods that her mother uh, was using in the homeschooling not related to the Unitarian uh, belief system or, or her family necessarily, just in parallel. Now, you could argue that she uh, resonated with Froebel because of her Unitarian beliefs to begin with. That's very likely. But uh, these are converging influences uh, on Frank Lloyd Wright. Take a little look at Unitarian belief system. Uh, you can actually Google and find them in uh, Unitarian churches in the United States in a number of places, uh, including Pennsylvania. Uh, I, have, I have not visited one yet. I had thought about doing that. Um, well, I actually visited Unitarian churches and um, uh, designs, in, or, or various church designs of Franklin Wright in, in, uh, in around Chicago and in Arizona, but the, the, I haven't visited and attended a service yet, and there are, I thought about that in Pennsylvania. So anyway, Unitarians, inspiration from all religions, love nature, see God in everything. Uh, let's see, we need not think alike, to love alike. An important message in these times, so the, I'm recording this right now during uh, the coronavirus pandemic and certain civil unrest and racial issues going on over a number of incidences uh, happening at the same time uh, where you know, there's more need for unity and understanding now than ever. 
Uh, so this is, uh, you can go and, uh, and search on your own some things about uh, Unitarianism, empowering, bold, accountable, faith-grounded action, environmental justice. That's interesting. Save the world, right? Green, organic design. I'll argue later on that uh, you can see uh, way before LEED, Leadership in uh, Energy Environmental Design Standards for Buildings, Frank Lloyd Wright was doing green things uh, before pretty much anybody in architecture. And there are other people, John Muir and things, you know, the environmental uh, initiatives at that time, but uh, actually in architecture, uh, environmental justice network. This is the Unitarian belief system of his mother's family. And he's being exposed to that. So where he lived and the faith of his mother's and family and his father too is a preacher, certainly an influence. So what else could possibly influence him not? Well, farm, rural farmland, farms. Yeah, he's growing up in Wisconsin now, back in Wisconsin. I mean, they had gone to New England. That's not farmland where they were there, but they're back in New England now, ages 10 to 20. Uh, this is an entire lecture on its own here on farmhouses and barns. Um, well, not this picture here, but I have a whole lecture on that where a, a farmhouse and barn uh, that uh, that's one of my architecture and construction projects that's of uh, another lecture uh, but you can see the form of the structure is united with the space defined within that's a quote from Frank Lloyd Wright um, <clears throat> so in the farm and the Lloyd Jones family uh, land in Wisconsin very much an influence on Frank Lloyd Wright throughout his whole life even though he moves away at a young age, but then moves back later on, we'll learn about, uh, but much later. Uh, so uh, this lecture I'm presently recording in Pennsylvania, this is a picture from my roof and some of my land, uh, a couple of parcels uh, that I renovated an old 170-year-old uh, uh, farmhouse. Which we'll see pictures of later on, some of it. Uh, this is it here. You could see the, the, the all, all the white extension that's coming off to the left, that entire two and a half story thing with the eyebrow window and that cascade of windows is all new. Uh, over 1,500 square feet. Uh, built it all myself uh, with the help of my son. One thing I subcontracted was uh, the concrete pour for the foundation work. And the roof shingles, but everything else doing by hand. All my Amish neighbors thought I was a carpenter for the first several years working on this. And you see my barn to the left here. I'll uh, talk about that in other lectures. But the farm farmland, so Frank, we're talking about Frank Lloyd Wright and the influences on him. And it's similar to where we are, uh, if you're in Pennsylvania listening to this right now, um, or in this region, very similar to uh, Pennsylvania farmland is Wisconsin farmland oh so a couple more pictures here this is my my project here uh, you can just see uh, I'm framing the views framing the views and then and, and, uh, I, I can't say I was thinking of Frank Lloyd Wright specifically when I was doing that that's just a good architectural thing to do but one thing nice about being the architect and uh, builder and engineer for a project is you get to uh, change things as you build it so I think about where the windows would be as I'm building and I had thought about the whole thing and built the whole model ahead of time but still um, you want to frame the views and you have the ability to change it if you're the builder designer uh, engineer uh, here's here's the project and this so this barn and farmhouse skeleton is a whole other lecture that I have uh, that I won't go into now you don't need to come back and drill into this now well it depends when you're viewing this uh, and the course that I'm creating this for right initially, this lecture, uh, there'll be a whole separate lecture uh, about the uh, skeleton beneath the skin, it's called, is what I've titled it. So this is my, my farm land. Uh, it's agriculturally zoned, but I'm not using it for that. So this is, uh, I think, an important slide that... Uh, you should really take note of and um, uh, in any any time you're looking at this I would like to ask students to
possibly write about this or be quizzed on this because this kind of brings it all together. Um, I haven't seen anybody quite state this exactly like I have here, so uh, you're not going to be able to Google and find all of this in one place. You certainly find parts of it. But so, you know, what influenced Frank Lloyd Wright? So we've talked about this, the Froebel system through his mother. And then what influenced Froebel, including Asian influences that um, you know, would later uh, certainly influence Frank Lloyd Wright even more. I didn't put Asia specifically going to Frank Lloyd Wright here because we're talking about the earliest influences. He hadn't been to Japan yet, where he eventually went and lived for five years and, uh, uh, and, and collected Japanese screens. I mean, he was certainly influenced by Japanese things later on. But we're talking about the, or his early life here. So he's being influenced by his mother and his father. And his mother is being influenced by Froebel, who uh, was influenced by Asian things. Um, and in parallel, parallel here, I show the whole Montessori thing, but not a direct link to Frank Lloyd Wright, because, again, he lived during the time that Maria Montessori was, uh, you know, developing things. In 1913, you know, Frank Lloyd Wright was born in 1867. We're talking about his youth here up to 1887. And Maria Montessori, uh, you know, until the early 1900s, she, she, I mean, she was uh, young also. So uh, it's in parallel. And then you know, the influence of his father and also Wisconsin farmland. So you can see the key influences here. Um, so, you know, his father during the big econ economic depression right after the Civil War, uh, people didn't donate to the churches. Uh, his talents in music, law, and government did not provide enough dollars at the time. I mean, that kind of work, well, not music so much, but law certainly pays a lot now, but not at the time. And people couldn't afford much of anything back then, let alone attorney fees. Um, he lost, now, Frank Lloyd Wright lost all contact with his father. His father continued composing, teaching, and publishing music. Now, the way it looks, I looked into some of the, the documents here, and, and what happened was uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's father couldn't support the family and all the children, and the Lloyd family was kind of sick of that. Uh, uh, and, you know, there's a big, powerful family. And they and you could find in the, the divorce proceedings that they just asked him to disappear uh, peacefully, and he did. And he had, you know, uh, his his children from his first marriage were full grown then, so he went and lived with one of them. I mean, it's a very sad thing because he was a big influence in, on Frank Lloyd Wright, and he didn't abandon the family, as Frank Lloyd Wright actually would do himself with his own family later but uh, was more kind of run out of town because he couldn't support everybody. But his father, anyway, still continued composing and teaching and publishing music. Uh, this is a quote um, from Hus Huxley. You can look in the references uh, about his father, Frank Lloyd Wright's father, is an artist, photographer, and designer of furniture, graphics, books, and buildings, his patronage of Chinese and Japanese art, his obsession with every aspect of his surroundings, his dedicated collecting of beautiful things owed much to his father. Frank Lloyd Wright attended the University of Wisconsin when he was 18 years old for one year in engineering. They did not have an architecture program. Uh, at this time, going to college was uh, not as common as it is to today. His father did have a bachelor's and master's from Colgate University, but that was rare thing at that time. And so you can see in this graph the number of schools compared to today. Even though Frank Lloyd Wright was only at the University of Wisconsin for a year, it did influence him, uh, the people there, uh, the surroundings, the architecture. We're going to look at a building in a minute where he spent a good deal of his time. And then he had a mentor. His mentor was an uh, engineering professor who also had an interest in architecture and worked a little bit on a building we'll see here in a second. His name was Alan Conover. And now what you see here is um, this science hall on the campus of the University of Wisconsin. And his mentor assisted the architect that designed this but now we're looking at uh, the influences on Frank Lloyd Wright of this building, uh, as well as his mentor, who was involved with the building. 
And so this science hall now, we're talking about certain aspects of this, and, and what you see here quoted are from uh, Storer 2017. That's the reference up above under the title. You can see, you can go back and look at that. Uh, this That's a catalog that I use in my courses written by, um, I believe, the professors at uh, Architectural Historian at the University of Texas now. Uh, I don't believe he was there when I was there in the 1980s for my degree in architectural engineering. Um, he may have been, uh, but um, <clears throat> this is an observation by Storer that uh, the building uh, that this building is built into the hill, and then Franklin Wright, who would often say is part of his organic design, building on top of a hill destroys the hill, and so. <clears throat> Uh, you could argue that this, uh, and this is an observation by Storer in his book, that uh, Franklin Wright was influenced by this building being built into the hill. Uh, also, uh, this characteristic of this building that would become very much uh, a key design feature in Franklin Wright's uh, buildings is that you uh, cramp the visitor, visitors um, or in, in the pathway leading up to the building or even in the entry hallways, make them low ceilings and dark and narrow. Not, not in a very un, super unpleasant way, but just a little bit of stress so that when you release it, the gray spaces become even more dramatic. So it's somewhat of a theatrical thing to do. Uh, he, he later named this the uh, embrace and release, also referred to as compression and release. Um, and you can see that in this building here, Storer is noting that the uh, somewhat winding way that you have to get up into the space with the exterior stairwell uh, is a key principle that may have influenced Franklin Wright from early on before he ever did any designs of his own. Also, this particular building, uh, when Franklin Wright's only 18 years old, um, has stripped away much of the interior, interior and exterior ornamentation typical of the Victorians of the time. Uh, and now the other modern architects would do this, and I, I won't get into that here in this lecture. I talk about that. I have other lecture series on architecture theory and, uh, and a number of other places. The modernists, the modern architectures of the architects of the time, were stripping away. Uh, all the ornamentation, and uh, but in the ways, in different ways. So, so Franklin Wright is a modern architect, but a very different kind of more modern architect because he develops his own uh, ornamentation, organic ornamentation, part of his organic design. And so he's he's certainly reacting to the uh, uh, and, and changing the way the, uh, the architecture of the time is, as are all the modern architects. But he's doing it in his own. Uh, very different way. Uh, the brick stone and the wood in the natural state. So part of the organic design of Frank Lloyd Wright is often uh, leaving materials, uh, often involves leaving materials in the natural state, even extending the materials on the inside to the outside and vice versa. Uh, and so this is done now, and this is done in this building uh, long before Frank Lloyd Wright has designed uh, any of his most famous buildings. I mean, he'll soon help design something here in a, in a moment, but he's only 18 here in, uh, in college, and he's going to school in this building with some of the uh, very unique architectural design concepts that uh, he will carry on later into his work. Um, the interior of this building is very open, so the whole open space, uh, open floor plan that Frank Lloyd Wright and, and others, you see it in uh, Japanese architecture and other places too, but um, you know, Frank Lloyd Wright is very well known for that, and so this science hall has that in it. This, this is a, a recent picture off the internet I have here, of course, uh, those aren't students in the, uh, in the early 19, or late 1800s. Um, but you can see the open space plan there. Um, innovative material. Steel skeleton allow building skin to be more architectural than structural. And later, uh, Franklin Wright would fr frequently use or created new materials for his architecture. So 
Uh, these materials and methods, uh, frankly, Wright would often throughout his career experiment with all kinds of different methods. And so this was a very uh, profound building uh, of the time, uh, you know, influence uh, arguably on the, on the world, certainly in Wisconsin, it's an influence in Madison, but a profound influence on Franklin Wright. He's a student, uh, you know, first time off of the farm in college in this building. So this is the, uh, uh, those, those last few comments were from Storer, and uh, I encourage you to uh, look at, at this book or buy this book. You may have it required already for uh, the lecture, uh, you know, for whatever course you're listening to this in. Um, some of you may have had this already in another course with me. If, uh, uh, but, but regardless, this is a great book. It has a catalog of all the uh, uh, built designs. Um, and uh, <clears throat> color photos and black and whites as well, and, and some very good narrative and observations. So we're gonna end this uh, lecture with his first design at age 19, actually just helping out. So he's helping out architect mentor Joseph Silsby. And uh, this is, you know, he gets this work uh, and mostly with the interiors, I believe the ceiling he helped out with here. But you know, it's his first first commission, and so he's only 19 years old. He only has a little bit of schooling, and he gets you know uh, not a commission, but he gets work with you know, through his family. And um, and you see a little quote here from the. This is a Unity Chapel, a Unity. Uh, uh, this is the right close to where his family's. Uh, uh, land is and so um, you know he's he's helping work on this um, and you can look into the details of this if you like and we'll come back and perhaps reference this in other lectures uh, and, or as uh, the first in a series of uh, uh, sacred spaces and this this actually this little chapel has a part of a later story too